message is called Family Matters. So when you saw that, you might have thought that I was going to maybe talk about this guy. Uh, we'll bring him up on the screen. Or yeah, you know, you remember Steve Urkel back in the 90s? Yeah, we all remember Steve Urkel. Did I do that? I, I see some of the teenagers looking at me like, who's this guy? All right. <laughs> they don't even know who Steve Urkel is. You need to look up Steve Urkel. You haven't lived until you know who Steve Urkel is. But, but anyway, we're not going to be touching on the famous sitcom from the 1990s. Today we're going to be touching on a topic that is so much more important and one that, that Jesus speaks to. And, and we're going to look at the importance of marriage and children today because Jesus talks about it here in, Ma, in, Ma, or in Mark chapter 10. But before we do that, let's go ahead and let's pray. Father, we thank you so much for the word that you're about to teach us today. God, we know that, that family is important to you that you created family as a means of providing love and support, but also accomplishing your mission in this world. And Father, we also know that in our world today, there's a lot of, well, there's a lot of things that are floating around out there about family. God, help us to understand today the importance of family to you and what family looks like in your eyes. So God, may your spirit speak to us. And God, if it challenges us today, maybe... It may be some of what's going to be said through your word. It Maybe it, it steps on our toes a little bit. But God, help us to be focused on what you want, on what you want for the family. And, uh, and God, we, uh, we thank you for your truth because we need it. Because your truth is there to, uh, to help us live the way that we're called to, but also to, to be protected and to be cared for. So God, just again, we ask for you to speak to us today. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. You know, like I mentioned in my prayer there uh, just now, um, there are a lot of opinions out there about family. You know, a long time ago, uh, there was, how many of you have heard of Mark Twain before? Mark Twain is a famous author uh, about 150 years ago. But one time Mark Twain was lecturing in Utah, and, and in Utah there, there was a large Mormon community, and at the time, the idea of polygamy was something that was still practiced within the Mormon faith or at least uh, officially. Today we know that there are still some groups that practice it, or at least try to practice it today. Well, anyway, Mark Twain gets into this long and heated debate with, with a polygamous Mormon there. And, and, this, and this man asks Mark Twain, he says to him, can you find for me a single passage of Scripture which forbids polygamy? And Mark Twain was a very witty guy. He always, had, he always had a good comeback. He said, certainly, there's a scripture in there that speaks to it. There's a scripture that says, no man can serve two masters. That's what he said. <laughs> okay. That's Mark Twain right there. You know, anytime we turn on the television, we check out social media, or even have conversation with other people, it seems that all kinds of ideas are being presented about human sexuality and about relationships. We see across the political spectrum, the ideological spectrum, everybody's got their input on what the family is supposed to look like, and usually people are very strong about this, this opinion. They're strong as to what family and se sexuality are supposed to look like, and it makes us think, you know, it, it makes us ask this question, and that this is the question that we'll start with today, is what am I supposed to think about family? What am I supposed to think about it? Because at times, as we listen to the discourse that's happening within our country and within our culture, it can, it can sometimes seem like both sides can make good points. But in the mix of all of this, the most important word I've found, at least on the most part, is being left out. What is Jesus' opinion on the matter? You know, we, we hear about this group's opinion and that group's opinion but, opinion, but what does Jesus have to say about it? And that's what we will find today when we come into Mark chapter 10. We're going to read the first 16 verses together, and like I do most weeks, we're going to kind of stop in a couple places and kind of survey some things that Jesus says. So let's go ahead and dig into the text. We're going to be using the New Living Translation today. It'll be on the screens, um, or you can pull it up on your Bible app. But here we go. Here's what it says. It says in verse 1 there in chapter 10, Then Jesus left Capernaum, and he went down to the re region of Judea and into the area east of the Jordan River. Once again, crowds gathered around him, and as usual, what was he doing? He was teaching. Now, we've seen this verse, it feels like, over and over and over again throughout the book of Mark, because it kind of gives us an idea of, okay, this is where Jesus is going next. But this one 
We might just kind of think, okay, it's just another descriptor of his journey, where he's going next. But really, there's something important to this one, and that is because Jesus now begins his final journey to Jerusalem. So this would be the final time that he was in his adopted hometown in Capernaum, kind of his headquarters of his ministry. His journey now starts back to Jerusalem, where, of course, as we will remember here in the coming weeks, he would give his life for us on the cross. Well, I was, as he was on the way, in verse 2 it says, some Pharisees came and they tried to trap him with this question. So we've seen this before too, right? Seems like the leaders were always trying to find a way to trap Jesus. And so they asked him this question. They said, should a man be allowed to divorce his wife? Now, now the word divorce, the Greek word divorce is apolio, which means to be set free, refute, re, release, excuse me, or to let go. Now, when we hear that, we may think, okay, well, what does that mean? You're just like just throwing somebody off? Well, not exactly, because in Jewish time, just as we see here, to, as we have in our culture today, there are legal things that are attached to marriage. And so when someone wanted to be divorced, they would have to have a legal certificate, because in many ways, a marriage was a contract. So again, when they ask Jesus this question, do you think that they really care what Jesus has to say about it? They really don't. They really don't care, but here's what they're doing. They wanted to know where Jesus was coming from theologically. They wanted to know his background. Okay, where, where is he coming from? Now, you might be thinking, okay, well, what, do you, what do you mean, Danny? Well, back in that day, and even today in modern Judaism, there are pretty much two schools of thought, two Jewish leaders that were held in very high regard who had kind of differing views on the Old Testament and specifically the first five books of the Old Testament, the Torah. These two schools of thought were of Shammai and Hillel. Now the picture, I, I, I don't know if I have a picture, but Shammai and Hillel, it might be later that I'm showing it, but Shammai and Hillel uh, were, were great theological teachers. They, they really dug into the word, but they had very different kind of approaches to the word. Shammai, he was a Jewish rabbi who was very literal about the text. He was very conservative in his approach to looking at the Torah. He took the Torah at face value, and he was also known as being very rigid. And then we had Hillel, who was a very kind and engaging teacher, but he, he was, let's just say, a little bit more creative with the text, and he didn't have as quite high of what we would consider a view of Scripture. Now, I'm going to come back to this in a little bit. I'm going to come back to these two, to, to these two rabbis in a, in a little bit. But let's keep reading here, okay? Because in verse 3, Jesus answered them with a question. What did Moses say in the law about divorce? So here they're wanting to know which, you know, which group is he a part of? Hillel, Shammai, which one is it? And Jesus has a question back for them. And then they answer in verse 4, well, he allowed it. He permitted it. He said a man can give his wife a written notice of divorce and send her away. See, the, the religious leaders of that time, what they, they had adopted a view on divorce that had really come from tradition and opinions as set forth from both Shammai and Hillel. See, that's what they were trying to do. They were trying to get Jesus pulled into this debate and trying to tie himself to a tradition and not something that was necessarily scriptural. Because, see, the school of Hillel thought that divorce could happen pretty much on a whim. If I don't like my wife, I could just divorce her. Whereas, when you look at Shammai, Shammai was much stricter, albeit he still allowed for there to be divorce. As a matter of fact, he, he would say that, that um, divorce could, could, any kind of sexual uh, crime or sin, uh, a divorce could happen. But, he, but he, what he did was he kind of expanded the rules a little bit. And Jesus responded in verse 5, look what he says to them. He says, he wrote this commandment, Moses, only as a concession to your hard hearts. Now, if you go back into Deuteronomy chapter 24, here's what was written there. We'll have it here on the screen. It says, suppose a man marries a woman, but she does not please him. Having discovered something wrong with her, he writes a document of divorce. You can see a lot of leeway there, right? He hands it to her and sends her away from his house. Okay, in verse 2. <clears throat> When she leaves his house, she is free to marry another man. 
But if the second husband also turns against her, writes a document of divorce and hands it to her and sends her away, or if he dies, the first husband may not, may not marry her again, for she has been defiled. That would be detestable to the Lord. You must not bring guilt upon the land the Lord your God is giving you as a special possession. Now, when you look at this verse, okay, and then we look at what Jesus is saying here, here's what Jesus is pointing out. He's saying that the reason why God gave this, or, or Moses writes this leeway is because in that time, there was this idea of sort of like this wife swapping thing. I divorce, and then I can marry somebody else. There wasn't, the, there wasn't a strong commitment to one another. And so there was a warning that's put here. And then Jesus goes on to say in verse 6, but he says this, and this verse is so important in our world today. He reaffirms the biblical idea that we see in the Old Testament where it says, but God made them what? Made them male and female from the beginning of creation. You know, as I've kind of been out in the social media sphere, and there's been a lot of stuff talked about with transgenderism, you know, there's been, a, there's been a lot of talk about that Jesus never speaks to it. <laughs> and I look at this and I'm like, it's, it's absolutely clear that he speaks to it. He says here, God made them what? Made them a male and made them a female. Now, the fact is, is that God only created two genders. That's what the Word of God teaches us. Now, does this mean that we disrespect and that we hate those who are maybe kind of caught up in the, tr in the confusion that comes with... Absolutely not. We still love. We still reach out. We still welcome. We still love those who are in that. But we have to stand on God's design. There's so much confusion in our culture today. And it's because we've moved away from God's design. And that's what happened with, with, the, with, the, with the Jews when it came to marriage. That's why Jesus is pointing this out to them. He's saying, the only reason that this, was, that this leeway was given to you was because, well, you, you were kind of asking for it. Well, in verse 7, he goes on to say that this explains why a man leaves his father and his mother and is joined to his wife, and the two are united into one, since they are no longer two but one. Let no one split apart what God has joined together. Now again, what we see here, what we saw in verse 6, was something pointing out the, the biblical concept that, that's been around since for thousands of years. But here in the last, I don't know, few dozen years, we, we think we know more, I guess. I don't know. We've seen this idea that, there, that today, that the scripture says there's only two genders. But then we look at verse, <clears throat> excuse me, in verses 7, 8, 9, and we see marriage brought into the equation. And what? Jesus says it's only between what? A man and a woman. Again, an idea that I've, I've heard floating around. Jesus never says anything about uh, gay marriage. Yes, he does. It's right here. It's right here. You know, our culture and our courts, they can say what they want, but God's rule stands for eternity. Now, Jesus... As he goes on here, he say, he's saying that marriage is an act of God. It's not a declaration of the courts or anyone else. Judges and theologians, they can write all they want, but it changes nothing in heaven. God is the one that brings them together, as he writes here. In Matthew 5.32, look what it says here as Jesus talks. He says, but I say that a man who divorces his wife, unless she has been unfaithful, causes her to commit adultery, and anyone who marries a divorced woman also commits adultery. What Jesus is saying is that he's saying divorce, there are places and there are times for divorce. He kind of gives this range. He talks about certain sexual activities, including things such as adultery, homosexuality, incest, along with others. There, are, there is a place for a divorce, but what was happening in that time was that they were, they were just finding little simple reasons to break off marriage. And Jesus said that, was, that is not what God wants. That's not why he created marriage. Now in verse 10, later it says when he was alone with his disciples in the house, the disciples brought up the topic again because they were really being challenged. or thinking, as often happened when they were with Jesus, their, their thinking was challenged. And he told them, whoever divorces his wife and marries someone else commits adultery against her. And if a woman divorces her husband and marries someone else, she commits adultery. See, this, this was a radical way of thinking for the disciples. 
Because they had been under this, these ideas from Shammai and Hillel that it was okay that there were certain reasons outside of sexual uh, impropriety that you could divorce and that it was acceptable to God when in fact it isn't. And they would challenge them. See, marriage matters. Marriage matters to God. In verse 13, now we see it shift a little bit and kids kind of come into the picture. In verse 13, one day some parents brought their children to Jesus so he could touch and bless them, but the disciples scolded the parents for bothering him. You know, we mentioned last week that the idea uh, or that, that the place of children in culture of that time was very low. They just weren't held in high regard. As a matter of fact, it was Christianity that changed the way people look at children. Did you know that back in ancient times, back during Jesus' time, there was a practice that was called exposure? Have you ever heard of this? I don't know, maybe you've never heard of this before. But it was called the practice of exposure. If somebody didn't want a child, you know what they could do? They could just leave them out in the middle of nowhere for any reason that they wanted, and there would be no legal ramifications for it. And it happened a lot. It happened a lot. See, there was a very low view of children. And now we see Jesus kind of changing the whole picture of this. When Jesus saw that was happening in verse 14, he said to them, let the children come to me. Don't stop them for the kingdom of God belongs to those who are like these children. I tell you the truth, anyone who doesn't receive the kingdom of God like a child will never enter it. Think about that. He's saying that you have to be like a child. He's saying children are the example if you want to try to get into heaven. And then he took the children in his arms and he placed his hands on their heads and he blessed them. See, the disciples had fallen prey to the idea, just like sometimes we fall prey to the idea, that to be powerful you have to be around the powerful. And here Jesus is saying, no, if you want to be with the powerful, the, the most powerful, if you want to be close to Jesus, you need to be with the least of these. See, Jesus wanted his followers, and he wants you and me to be like children. Because children, well, children, if you think about it, when a, when a child uh, in, their, in their earliest years, they come as they are. There's no hesitation in them. There's no inhibition in them. They're just filled with trust. And you know what? When they come, they come empty-handed. They have nothing to give. That, that's, what God, that's how God wants us to come to Him too. Don't come with your own self-importance, your own ego. Don't come with your good deeds thinking you could somehow prove yourself to Him. We come with nothing to the one who has everything. And I love this image we see here at the very end where Jesus scoops the children up and he blesses them. You know what, this, this, this whole instance, and we might just read by this, this interaction here with Jesus and the children, but there's something deeper in this because it gives us an illustration of our relationship with, with God. When we come before God, we have to be like children. And what does God do? He scoops us up and he protects us and he has saved us. And he blesses us. We truly do see ourselves in this story. And so today, in this, in this passage, there's something that I think that's really important. And there, there's this concept that is kind of woven throughout the passage that Jesus speaks to when it comes to both marriage and even with children. And that is this, is, that com is the importance of commitment. That commitment should never come cheap. You know, unlike those of Jesus' day and, and even some in our own day, as Christ followers, we should never believe that com commitment to one another should come cheaply. It comes with a cost. And it's not easy. But God calls us to that. You know, I, I think back, I've, you know, in the many years of my marriage, there's been times where, just like in every marriage, there's challenges that come. But giving up's never been an option for us, even though it's been challenging at times. See, relationships cannot be treated as something that's easy to discard. 
there's a story of a, of a couple that had been married for 35 years, and, and every morning, the wife, what did she do? She gave her husband a grapefruit for breakfast. She would cut it in half, give him a spoon. Place. There are some people that love eating grapefruit in the morning. I know growing up in Florida, my dad uh, ate grapefruit a lot. We had a grapefruit tree, and he ate it a lot. But one day... She ran out of grapefruit, and so she apologizes to her husband. She's like, I'm so sorry, I don't have any more grapefruit. Grapefruit, And the husband goes, it's okay, it's okay, I never really liked grapefruit anyway. You know, for 35 years he's been eating grapefruit, even though he didn't like grapefruit. I mean, when I, when I read that story, I thought to myself, now that's some commitment there, right? That's some commitment. And it didn't come cheap, eating that sour grapefruit, if you've had grapefruit. But you know, whether it's in our marriage, whether it's marriage, and, and obviously in the text we're looking at today, it's, it's focused primarily on marriage, but even in friendships, even in relationships with coworkers or classmates, God doesn't want us to just discard people. See, for whatever reason, those within the Jewish religious circles thought that there were reasons you could do that when it came to marriage. Jesus doesn't want us to do that. Today, I, I brought with me uh, kind of two signs with me, and, and I wanted to point this, this out because we have these two schools that I mentioned earlier. So we have the school of Shammai, and Shammai was someone who was very literal. I guess you would kind of consider him conservative, but he also had a judgmental streak to him when you read his writings. His writings were even read today. And then, then he had Hillel, which I guess you could say was a little bit loose with the Scripture, he, was, he tended to be liberal, but he was also very carefree. So you have these two different mindsets as they looked at the Scripture. And, and as the more I thought about it this week, I thought to myself, this is kind of where we're at as a culture and society today. We have the Shammai and the Hillel. We have the conservative and the liberal. We, we have all these different... Uh, we have these differing viewpoints today, and, and what's happening is it's causing a rift and a division in our culture, perhaps that hasn't been seen in, in many, many, many decades. I want to challenge you today, though, to think a little bit differently, because here's what happens, and I've seen it, I've seen it go in both directions. What we tend to do is we discard the other because we have a different viewpoint. I'm not trying to say here today that certain things of this group or certain thing that everything is right, but what I am saying is that we need to regain a spirit of love to one another. And when Jesus was speaking of marriage, and we see this when he's talking in other areas, he, he, he's pointing out to the religious leaders at that time that, that not only were they kind of drifting away from the word of God, they, were, they drifted away from the spirit of it as well. They decided that they would think for God. We have to be really, really <laughs> wary of that mindset. We, we have to look at the Word of God and not only read it to understand it, but understand the spirit of what it has to say. Because here's what happens. If we don't, we usually, we usually find ourselves in these two different sides. On the one side, maybe if we were kind of like uh, the Shammai, you know, if we're kind of the, of the Shammai mindset, what do we tend to do is we, we, look at, we look at the Word of God and we take it very literally, and then what happens is, is we can become very legalistic and judgmental. You know, there are people I've had in my life, I love them to death, they, they take the Word of God very strictly, as they should, but then what happens is it ends up that they become very judgmental and legalistic. And they miss out on the spirit of what Jesus is teaching. See, when Jesus was teaching about marriage, and he was talking about how God wants it to be a commitment. He, all, he, he wasn't also saying that we should just totally discard and disregard the peop, those who have gone through divorce. He's saying God doesn't want us to sin, but if we do sin, His love and His grace is there to cover it. Isn't, isn't that what we've seen throughout the book of Mark? I mean, am I wrong there? I, I don't think so. Maybe I am. But, but what I've seen throughout the book of Mark is that Jesus says, here's the word of God, and we should abide by the word of God, but, but he came to give us grace when we do sin. That doesn't mean that we go out and sin because we know we're going to be covered. <laughs> we take God's word seriously, and we try to live by it. 
But when we do mess up, His grace is there to cover us. See, Jesus says, follow the Word of God, but also follow the Spirit of it. Jesus says to stick to the truth that has been given to us, but perhaps be a little bit free in the way that we, in the way that we practice that, in the way that we show love to others. Sure, we should be wise when it comes to judging character, but also we should be carefree in showing love to those who make mistakes. See, what we tend to do is, is we, there's something about finding comfort, I think, and camping out in one of these places. We find comfort with our crew over here. We find comfort with our crew over here. And we don't stop to consider that maybe there's a little bit that can be learned from the different groups that we run into in our life. I'm telling you, that this, this is what I, I'm concerned about, not just culturally, but even in the church. We're starting to camp out. We're, we're camping out in places. Jesus wasn't the type to camp out. <laughs> if you look at his ministry, right? I mean, he hung out a lot, it sounds like, with all these interactions he's having with teachers of the law. He hung out with a lot of different people, people that were very different than him, thought differently than him. And we've seen he didn't always agree with them. <laughs> and he pointed it out. Maybe we should be learning a little bit more of his example. See, here, here's where I want to, here's, here's something I want you to think about. I want to encourage you to form your commitments by his truth over the climate of culture. Our culture today is when it comes to things like marriage, it's saying, oh, just give up on it for any reason. You know, one of the things that we are struggling with the winds of culture is the lack of stability. We're seeing, I, I, don't you feel that way? I feel that way. Like, I feel like it's just so unstable. Like you're afraid of saying something online. You're afraid of saying something because there's just this lack of stability in our culture. See, God created family and relationships in order to establish and bring stability to our lives individually, but also to our culture. And part of that, part of maintaining family is the importance of commitment. Yes, it's our sin that's going to pull us and try to get us to break away our commitment. And, it, and that can come in so many ways. It can come in our marriage vows. It can come in our commitments and our relationships with our friends. We cannot throw away our relationships. See, we honor God when we are committed in marriage. We honor God when we are committed in our relationships to one another. So again, don't give in to the culture that's that really what we have a throwaway culture don't don't give in to that throwaway culture engage with people be committed to one another love one another as jesus has taught us love your enemies even because here's what i want to also point out is we need to avoid judgmentalism and legalism when relationships fail you know what, all of us in here, we, and maybe you yourself, maybe you've gone through a divorce or you've gone through a relationship that is, that is broken and maybe, maybe what you felt at times is you felt kind of ostracized for that. You've been looked down upon. I, I'm sorry if that's the way you felt because that's not the way Jesus would handle it. You know what, we know that God hates divorce. The scripture tells us that. God hates divorce. But I want you to know today that just because he hates divorce doesn't mean that he hates you. And unfortunately, the church at certain times in its history is, has kind of had this not-so-loving approach to those who have gone through divorce. Jesus loves each of us, whether we've gone through divorce or whether we haven't. And what I want to challenge you today is if maybe you haven't gone through divorce, but you've seen someone else who has to be very careful not to become legalistic in that. You don't know, you don't know uh, it, when you know someone in your life that's gone through divorce, you don't know why it, it didn't make it. You don't know all the details of the story. You don't know what they went through in that marriage. You don't know what God thinks about their particular circumstance. That's why we've got to be careful not to get into the whole judging thing because we don't know everything. That's one of the reasons Jesus said we shouldn't judge. Now, Again, he's not saying we shouldn't judge when it comes to character, but we don't judge a person's relationship with God, okay? You don't know what God thinks about their, relation, their, their circumstance, so we shouldn't be putting ourselves in the judgment seat. You know what Jesus has called us to do? 
He's called us to stand by the truth, but he's also called us to love. We do both. We stand firm in the truth of God's word, but we also show love to those who have struggled in that, which includes ourselves. Again, going back to this, maybe there's a, the, the, these two schools of thought, Shammai and Hillel, there's something maybe that we can learn in both. Love those who are in broken relationships. Support those that are in broken relationships. Encourage those who are in broken relationships. And if you are, if you are maybe that person, maybe you are walking through that right now in your life, I want to encourage you to allow people to come into your life to support and encourage you in that. Because I've seen it happen when, when those who walk through divorce, they can kind of isolate themselves. And God doesn't want that for you. He wants you to, to have others to come alongside you and encourage you and support you. Because here's the thing. We need to leave room for God's grace. You know what, I, I've now been doing, I've now been in ministry for 25 years. I remember when I first started in ministry, I was one of these know-it-all like kids. Like I was like, oh, I went to seminary and now I know everything there is to know, you know. And so then I can remember just having, I'll admit and I, I will apologize and I will even repent here before the Lord. I mean, I had like really low view on, on those who went through divorce. I really did. And then I learned very quickly how sin has just infiltrated everything. And as time's gone along, I think kind of the opposite has happened to me than what maybe some... I think I've become more and more grace-oriented as, as the years have gone along because I've seen what people walk through and... And I've seen a lot of broken marriages. I've, I've seen violence in marriages. I've counseled those who have got, had violence in their marriage. I've counseled those who have gone through mental and, and emotional abuse. And it's really challenged me to, to interact the way that Jesus would with those who are going through those hurts and those, their pains in their lives. We need to leave room for God's grace. You know, the causes vary for divorces. Sometimes it can be from illness. Sometimes it's substance abuse, affairs. There can even be crime. You know what? Jesus has told us that when people walk through hurt, we don't leave people on their own. We walk with them. And I also want to say that if you're in that place of hurt today, leave room in your life for God's grace for yourself. Because... He wants to show his grace to you. Again, like I said earlier, yes, the scripture says that God hates divorce. He does not want that in our marriages. He does not want that at all. He hates divorce, but he, but he doesn't hate you. And so what I want to challenge all of us to do this week is to reach out for help if your marriage is hurting and reach out to maybe someone, maybe that's not you, but maybe it's someone you know. See, God put us in this place and time and amongst this church community, this church family for a reason. I've thought that since day one, that God puts people together for reasons. And one of the reasons that he has put us together is that we are here to support one another. The person that you need to allow into your life to support you and encourage you if you're walking through this is right here today. They're here. But you have to be willing. And you know what? In this room today, there's someone that it needs you to show encouragement and support. And maybe it's somebody you don't even know that well. Maybe it's just letting them know that you're glad that they're here, that you're glad to know them, that whatever it is, God wants you to reach into their lives. And so this week, I want you to take that challenge seriously. If you're going through a rough time in marriage, reach out. If you can reach out to me, or maybe I can connect you with someone that can help you through that. Maybe help you find a good Christian counselor to walk through that. Maybe you need to find friends who have godly influence, who are godly, who seek out God's truth in their lives to influence your life. Don't go through the hurt and the pain on your own. All too often, we, we isolate ourselves. And again, maybe you're not the one going through it, but reach out to them. Have coffee with them. Invite them over for lunch. Let them know that God loves them and that you love them. 
You know, some, a few years ago, I ran into this really neat tool that maybe I would encourage you, um, if, if you're married, there's a, there's a blog. If you go to symbus.com slash blog, there's a listing of all these different marriage topics, and it's, it's, there's really good biblical information there I want to point you out to, because they might be helpful for you in your own marriage right now, but they might be helpful for you in helping somebody else in their marriage. Because, see, marriage grows stronger when we fight to keep the commitment. See, in many ways in this world, we are in a battle. It's a war. And there's a war that's going on that's seeking to re redefine marriage and personhood. But the fight is worth it to God. But the way that we fight this fight isn't with guns and hateful words. <laughs> we fight these battles with prayer. We fight these battles with God's truth. We fight these battles with love. We need to stand for the truth of God's word, yes, when it comes to marriage and when it comes to gender, yet we also need to live in the midst of grace and realize that people, all of us, are living in a really confused world. It's a confused place. And commitment, even when you disagree, is, is so important. We're never going to be able to reach into people's lives if we are not committed to doing so in love. You know what, we truly are, um, we truly are like the children that Jesus invited to come to him. We come with nothing, we're, helpful, we're helpless, but yet what does he want to do? He wants to bless. He wants to bless you and me. And that blessing comes through Jesus Christ as he gave his life for us on the cross. And so, here today, I want to invite you to make that decision to give your life over to Him and to His truth. Let Him change your heart. Let Him change your hands and your feet. Let Him change the actions of your life. Let His attitude become your attitude. Accept His sacrifice for you on the cross. Because here's the thing, and Jesus points this out, is that commitment never comes cheaply. God paid the price toward us, and we can do the same to others. Jesus paid the price to be committed to you and me. And so he's asking us, asking us to do the same to others.